about primary sources, but I want to share with you something I shared with the last group that uh, I read a couple of days ago, and it just, it made me sad because I'm a history person. I love history. I think history is so important. I could argue all day that the most important subject we study is history. Uh, not everybody agrees with me, but uh, it's, it's my view, and I'm sticking with it. But I read this a uh, couple of days ago, and I wanted to share it with you because it, it really talks about why we really need to get back to teaching history. On last year's National Assessment of Educational Progress Test, high school seniors nationwide were given an excerpt from a landmark 1954 Supreme Court case that included the passage this is the passage they were given. We conclude that in the field of public education, separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Then the children were asked what social problem uh, the ruling was intended to correct. Got teachers in here? Could your students answer that question? Raise your hand if you think they could. You think they could? then they would join the 2%, 2 percent, 2 percent of seniors nationwide who were able to answer that question correctly. And they weren't required to answer it correctly. You didn't even have to know Brown versus the Board of Education was that ruling. You just had to know what social problem that ruling was referring to. 2 percent. The test showed that American students are less proficient in history than in any other subject overall. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, however, civil rights is an especially neglected topic in schools. The group, which recently completed a comprehensive review of state standards and curriculum frameworks, found that most state standards virtually ignore it. So that kind of um, tells you a little bit about where we are in the study of history. And so why should we study history? What's the big deal? Why should we study it? We all are, are in the present right now. We think about the future. History's the past. Why go there? We go there because we have to go there. We have to study history. History is the laboratory, I read this somewhere and I love this quote, the laboratory of human experience. And it is. It tells us how we got where we are today. It helps us understand people. It helps us understand societies. It helps us understand change and how the society we live in today came to be. Uh, it gives students experience in assessing evidence the ability to assess conflicting interpretations. If you were here this morning and listened to Dr. Fallon, who was amazing, just think about the accounts of what happened in 1963 from Bull Connor and from some of those children who were in the Children's March. Students have to be able to understand who's saying what, why they're saying it, analyzing that, uh, and thinking about it critically. Uh, it's especially important because now we're, we're in an uh, election year and just a couple of days we're going to uh, elect a president. And we're bombarded with ads on television. And if you don't know how to critically assess what those ads are saying and pamphlets that you get and flyers and phone calls, you've got to be able to critically think about, about that and um, assess conflicting interpretations because we certainly have conflicting interpretations with our uh, presidential candidates. So if we don't teach children that, we're doing them a disservice. And I thought about this morning when I was listening to Dr. Fallon, there's a quote that I absolutely love, and I saw it on a history website, and it's just, it stuck in my mind, and I thought about it as I was listening to Dr. Fallon. History well told is a beautiful story, and he certainly told a beautiful story today. 
All right, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about primary sources. Uh, there's some websites that you're going to have on your thumb drive. They are fabulous for primary sources and for telling what a primary source is because students don't really understand that. What is a primary source? Uh, all information that we have about the past comes from somewhere. That's a source. So we have a lot of sources. So what, why are primary sources so important? When you listen to Dr. Fallon, who actually talked to Dr. King and uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth, and, and he knows the story. He got it firsthand. He was there. That's a primary source. And it's engaging for students. It personalizes history. Um, and it's authentic. It's real people who were actually there. Um, so primary sources are created by witnesses to history, uh, people who are actually there. It's the raw material of history. Um, and it gives us such a powerful sense of what happened. So we're going to look at um, some primary sources. These are, uh, there's some websites, National Archives, Smithsonian Institution, Library of Congress. You may have heard of all of those, but the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, fabulous source. Go there and look and see all the things that, that they have. Um, this is a primary source. Uh, when I saw this, it, it was just amazing to me. Um, this was put out by the Citizens Council of Greater New Orleans, and uh, it's a notice. And who's it? Who who was this notice to? All white citizens. All white citizens. So this Citizens Council certainly didn't include all citizens. It is the white citizens, and um, apparently. Ford had given money to NAACP, so this is saying let's boycott Ford. Let's don't buy Ford products. It is. So, uh, well, I think this, I think they're putting this uh, presentation on the website, the, the slideshow, so I think it'll be on there. Uh, I think I got this from the Gilder Lehrman website, though. It, 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 is it on that one? Yeah. Um, so obviously, this didn't work because Ford is doing quite well. <laughs> um, music. The music of the time is a great primary source. Uh, there are, these are uh, websites that have lots of music. And the one, the pbs.org uh, one, I think that is a, if I remember correctly, a one-hour presentation of, of all of the, some of the great music of the, the civil rights movement. Uh, when children hear me, sometimes I have given children just lyrics and um, I thought I brought one today. I may not have. Yeah, there's one, uh, one of my very favorite uh, singers when I listen to music of the civil rights, and I actually have her on my iPod, <laughs> uh, is Nina Simone. She has a wonderful voice. I love listening to her. She was a classically trained African-American singer, musician. She was a pianist, and she wanted to go to the Curtis Institute of music in Philadelphia. So she went, she had a great uh, interview and a great uh, presentation that she did for uh, the people who were going to make the decisions. And then she went home feeling pretty good. She wasn't offered a space. And later she was told it was because she was black that she was not offered a space. And so knowing her background story and listening to her songs and listening as she sings about uh, the songs of the civil rights era, it, it really brings home that passion she has and why she's involved in the movement. And I think just showing some of those lyrics to students 
letting them analyze the, li- the lyrics, look, what do you think this is talking about? She did one song, um, and this has an ugly word, sorry. Uh, it's called, but it's a very famous song of the civil rights uh, era. It's called um, Mississippi Goddamn. Anybody ever heard of that? Just read those lyrics. Alabama's got me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. And everybody knows about Mississippi, goddamn. It, I mean, it goes on. It's just amazing. Uh, can't you see it? Can't you feel it? It's all in the air. I can't stand the pressure much longer. Somebody say a prayer. Uh, long song. Uh, I don't know if you want to show those lyrics to children. You might get in trouble. Uh, but I just think th- there are a lot more that are just as powerful. <laughs> you, yeah, you might lose your job. Don't, don't do that one. But I wanted to share it with you because that really, to me, when I know her backstory and I know that song, you can just feel why she was so passionate about that and why she wrote a song like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, pictures. And I was noticing with uh, my colleagues' books this morning, where are the two that had pictures? The Children's March? Yes, and the other one. These pictures that I picked out to show you uh, are also their primary sources. And to give children these pictures and say, what do you notice? What do you notice about this one? And you can see it's a little blurry, but what do you see there? Little boy? Yeah. What about the mood? Yeah, they're happy. They're smiling. They're excited. They're getting ready to be a part of something. They're getting ready to be a part of history. And then you look at the next picture of fire hoses used against children. Who would do that? But it happened, and we need to know about it. Our children need to know about it. And then you look at the next picture. Again, children, what do you notice? What's the mood? Solemn. Yeah, they're being arrested. They're fearful. They're apprehensive. They don't know what's going to happen. All of that excitement they started out with, now you've got little children frightened about what's going to happen. And when I looked at these books, I saw these same two pictures. Uh, So giving something like that to children, just the two pictures, and asking them, what do you notice? What's different? Um, Another thing that that one time, when I was teaching high school, I had uh, my, I taught 11th graders. And I had them, we looked at some pictures, didn't, weren't on the internet, they were in books, because this was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, but I had them go out with their, with their parents and take pictures, try to find these exact spots in Birmingham. And they were able to do that for several of them. But what a great project for, for kids to see what's changed, what's different about, about uh, this when you can look at some of these pictures. So pictures are excellent primary sources and um, important for students. A lot of websites, we've we've given you lots and lots of information for where to go to get music, to get pictures, to get uh, firsthand accounts, uh, because Primary sources are so important. We need to use primary sources in our teaching. And I think nothing is better than thinking about Dr. Fallon's speech this morning and how powerful the testimony of someone who, who was there is. Uh, and that's what we want to get our children excited about history. We want our children to be good citizens. You have to study history if you're going to be a good citizen. Uh, We have to study history to know, you know, there's the quote. It's been attributed to a lot of different people. I think the first person I've heard it attributed to was Edmund Burke, that if we don't study history, we're doomed to repeat it. And we see that 
all through history, the same kind of things are happening. And I think children need to know that they can make a difference, that one person can make a difference. And these little children, one at a time, made a difference in, in history. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Claybo. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you need this. I do not have to be sold on using primary sources. After two years of a dissertation on primary sources, I was sold uh, day one. <laughs> um, I do want to provide you guys with two websites that were very beneficial to me and I think extremely helpful in the process and provides tons of primary sources. If you go to Google and type in History Matters, you get a fantastic website that is a collection of primary sources. And again, that's History Matters. The second website, this one's a little more complicated, but for the record, it is my favorite social studies website that I've seen. Favorite. If you Google primary sources and social studies central together. Again, that's primary sources and social studies central. I need to say it one more time, guys? Central, correct. So if I go to Google, type in primary sources and social studies central together, you'll get this website. And it's just a collection of websites with different kinds of primary sources. One website in the, within this main website has music from the different time periods. It has propaganda posters from World War I. Those two come to mind right off the top of my head. A lot of other primary sources collected there. <laughs> One thing that I forgot to say. Uh, I forgot to mention my number one reason for using primary sources. There's primary sources, there's secondary sources, there's tertiary sources. Your textbook is a tertiary source. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes when I read what's in textbooks, I wonder mm -hmm. if they've ever even seen the primary source. Mm -hmm. So it's so important not to rely on the textbook. And the textbook is somebody's idea of this is what's important. Mm -hmm. So whoever that person is, and unfortunately it's usually somebody in Texas or California because they're the biggest states and the textbook companies cater to them. So you get history from someone else's viewpoint. Another reason it's so important to use primary sources. Okay. So if we look, start out with document analysis, I think that's the appropriate way to start out using primary sources. Now we're going to move to what I spent two years working on with a dissertation on how to use primary sources. Uh, I'm a big proponent of students creating their own faux primary sources. This means that students create a newspaper, a diary entry, a journal, a wanted poster, there's all kinds of interesting people that could be wanted for all kinds of different things. They create their own wanted poster, and I do have some examples of these. If you guys want to get a card from me, I would be more than willing to email you some of the ones that I've created. And I've bribed my friends that, one of my friends that was a former art major through Olive Garden dinners to draw for me as well to go with these <laughs> faux primary sources. I think it's important to, to do these types of activities to really get students engaged in the material to get them understanding the human aspect of these different people. All these higher order thinking steps. I'm going to try to model quickly three different kinds of faux primary sources that your students can create. The first one is a journal entry. I had the opportunity this past December in Washington, D.C. 
to meet the author of We've Got a Job, Cynthia Levinson. She talks about a nine-year-old girl who participated in the Children's March. With that said, I created a diary entry from the perspective of this nine-year-old girl. <clears throat> Dear diary, I have got lots of hugs this week. My mommy and daddy hugged me last night and told me to be brave today. My daddy even took me to get a game from the store to play during my time in jail. He knows that I've been looking at that game for weeks. My papaws and meemaws hugged me too and told me everything was going to be okay. My teacher, Mrs. Willis, cried when I turned in my homework for last night as my mommy told her why I would be absent from school today. I was sad to miss school since we were going to the library, but I want to be free. Mrs. Willis told me in history class, injustice is not going to fight itself, so I need to get involved to help. This account I created is of a nine-year-old girl who participated in the Freedom March, or the Children's March in 1963. That's one way we could use faux primary sources to get at diary entries, the thoughts, feelings, and perspectives of people. Very powerful, guys, if we're going to un have our students have a deep understanding of content material across the, whatever the material may be. Getting at their motivations is very important. The second activity was inspired by this book, Let Freedom Sing, as well as Freedom Song, Young Voices and the Struggle for Civil Rights. You notice on the tables that there's sticky notes. I think there should be sticky notes on it, all the tables. I want each of you to get a sticky note. I have to admit, I got here very early this morning after I had some caffeine to get going, just so I could get sticky notes on all the tables for you. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do with this one. I created a stanza for you, for you about a civil rights freedom song. I want you to write a line after you hear this. Reverend Bevel said that our cause was just. I hope my teachers do not get mad, but I must work to end injustice that has kept generations of people sad. My rhyming skills are not fantastic. I fully fess up to that. I want you guys to create one line that you would add on to my first stanza of the song. Just one line. Okay. The, the stanza is, Reverend Bevel said that our cause was just. I hope my teachers do not get mad but I must work to end injustice that has kept generations of people sad. Just one line, guys. I want you to create one line that can be added on to my song. Take just another minute or two. Okay, now that you have your line, I need some brave volunteers to share with us. Who's going to be first brave volunteer? I will. Okay. Um, you, I, I wrote down your last words in each line, just, get mad, injustice, sad. 
hope because it was a religious movement, as Dr. Bell was saying, with the hope of a bright future glass. Very good. Very good. Yes, sir. I don't care if into a jail I'm crammed because everybody knows about Birmingham, goddamn. <laughs> 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 Very good. Yes, ma'am. Freedom is against law. Discrimination was false. Oh, very good. There are several different ways we can approach using this activity, guys. We can have each student write a line like I had you guys do just now, and you can combine them all together and have a class song. Yes. And then you could organize the lines. You could break students into groups and have them create their own song and spread it out where each student does maybe four lines or however what works for your situation. I did this with my class and I did a um, song. I have to say my students, one of them raised my hand, raised his hand and said, Mr. Claybo, that was weak. I mean, come on, Mr. Claybo. And I just looked at him and I said, you think that's weak? He said, yeah. I said, do one better. That pen picked up from that young man's uh, desk and he went crazy. And he, when he was finished, he had one of the most beautiful songs that I could get publish, published anywhere. Very powerful. Very powerful. I have one more. With this activity, we're responding to an existing primary source. I have to give you a little backstory here. This was hard for me to write. I got stuck at least four times, and when I get stuck, I pace. So I was pacing back and forth in my UAB office, up and down the hall, the first floor, until I got this just how I wanted it. This is entitled, A Letter in Response to the Children's Crusade in Birmingham. And with this one, we're looking at assuming the role of a historical figure from Martin Luther King, Jr. I am writing this letter to express my emotions to one of the most moving scenes in recent days. The event that I speak of is the Children's Crusade for Equal Rights in Birmingham, Alabama. The rain that has fallen the last four nights is the tears of God Almighty seeing the harsh treatment that little black girls and boys suffered those days in Birmingham. This event shows the depths of darkness in some men's souls when consumed with the passions of racism. It warms my heart and gives me hope for tomorrow that little black boys and girls march peacefully in the streets of Birmingham. Each of these children carried within them the hope that one day, in the not-so-distant future, there would be no glass ceiling on what they can accomplish, and that the love in their hearts would extinguish the fires of hatred and prejudice that have spread over this country. I believe that children are God's spies, making sure that we live up to the ideas and values that we claim to cherish in our hearts. The actions of the police force in Birmingham are proof that the ideals set forth in the Constitution are not the reality in this country for every man and woman. I am here to say, my friends, do not despair or lose hope about the recent events in Birmingham. Five scores ago, an American had a dream for freedom and justice for everyone, which today we are closer to fulfilling. The images from Birmingham has caused everyone in this country to look within their souls and realize that we must change to redeem the institutions and the principles that this great country is founded upon and serve as a shining light for the people of the world. Took me a very long time to come up with this. Um, let me kind of talk about why I think this is important. When I assumed the role of Martin Luther King Jr., I listened to, in my office, three times in a row, I have a dream speech, back to back to back. And I tried to mimic some of the writing styles and strategies that he uses in his writing. He's very, very good 
at implementing history within his dialogue. And keep in mind, and we heard this earlier, he was a minister by trade. So he had this combination of optimism plus an old school Baptist model of teaching from his uh, days as a minister, from being a minister that's in his writing. So it's, it helps students get at the context of what it was like to live in a time period and capture a certain person's point of view. That's a very powerful idea, guys. Very powerful. We could do this, I know we're focusing on the Civil Rights Movement in 1963, we can do this in practically any content area, depending on who we're studying and what the topic may be. I think regardless of whatever type of faux primary source that we're talking about and wanting students to create, it's important to keep in mind that with each of those activities, students are using their creativity, their ideas, and they're displaying their content knowledge in creative ways. And the first question I'm sure that I would be asked by anyone is, Jeremy, where is your proof? I want to see the proof of what you're saying. Show me the proof that this is beneficial. I have my proof with me today. My proof is called, is a book entitled September 12th, We Knew Everything Would Be All Right. This book is not written by someone like me. It is written by first grade students from H. Bryan Masterson Elementary in Missouri the day after September 11th. I'm just going to read a couple pieces for you guys. On September 11th, 2001, any bad things happened. September the 12th was a new day. We knew everything would be all right because the sun came up. It is. And guys, here's how we knew that everything was going to go back in order. This is the clincher. We knew everything would be all right because we had homework. <laughs> <laughs> two plus two still added to be four. We knew everything would be all right because the stars and moon came out and America went to sleep. And the next morning, the sun came up again. Not the end. Was this by me? Oh, no. This, this work was by... These guys. One of the many things that I constantly talk about, I almost have this group of them. They're called Claboisms. I hear it all the time. Dr. Clabo, you've got your Claboisms. you got one for almost everything. Here's my one central one. If you give students an opportunity to be creative, they will always, always rise to the challenge, guys, and find ways to really impress you with what they're talking about, what they're doing in the classroom, and you'll get things like these. The best activities that I've used in my classroom, I had an idea and my students took it and ran a completely different direction than I had ever envisioned it being used in the classroom. That's a very powerful idea. It's something to hang on to. And another, I think if you look at a lot of these activities that we've talked about, they have a certain level of creativity to them. I believe all teachers are creative, guys. If I'm my Claboism number two, that would be it. All teachers are creative. And I think it's this kind of creativity that we need to use in our classroom, guys, if we are to continue the march, so to speak, forward with our students 
that we're, talk, that we're here to talk about and honor with a generation that struggled, that another group of people can move forward. We are the ones that are going to have to do that so that all students are given a chance at a high quality education so that there is no concept of a glass ceiling of what they can do today, tomorrow, or any other days to come in the future. I thank you very much. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. I intentionally, and this is very hard, any teacher will attest to this, I intentionally tried to be shorter and not say as much. All teachers will attest that's hard to do. The reason I wanted to do that is to see if we had any questions we wanted to talk about for either one of us. I, one of the most beautiful inventions is Amazon.com. I'm a big believer in that. I went to Amazon and the books that I showed and that are in the handout, I got all of them relatively cheap on Amazon. Yes, ma'am. What is your opinion about using this sort of primary sources for debates? Children can familiarize with the primary sources so that they can take a position. For example, <coughs> the students could either Okay. I think these activities can be adapted for any age level. When I sit down to create these, I tried to make them across the board adaptable as possible. Um, the one thing I would keep in mind when you're doing activities with primary sources like this, you want to keep them small, kind of short to start with, and build students' ability level to write. I think that's very important. The one that just jumps out of my, to my mind right off the bat, I'm also a big proponent of using popular culture. I would create, if I wanted to get at this diverse points of view, this is the first one that jumps to mind. If I were studying the American Revolution and I'm looking at Hamilton and Jefferson for, our, for just a second, create a Twitter war between these two individuals where we get at both of their perspectives through short tweets. And you build the conversation of the different points of view. I think that would be a very interesting way to start out using primary sources. I think it does, it's one of the higher order thinking levels that you're able to get at through different writing activities. If that's a short one, and then try to build their writing skills, guys, because you can't, I'm a big fan of not necessarily starting off trying to get the Hail Mary pass, so to speak. I want to build them step by step to get to an ultimate finish line, so to speak. And I think that's how I approach any writing activity. So I would start with something like that and work up. I think drama presentations of different sorts are another way to really get students involved. Read Reader's Theater, you can get online for free. They're great sources, guys, and there are dramatic plays that you can get with content material. You can let students create their own Reader's Theater. They enjoy doing that. Um, I wanted to share with you something that uh, Jeremy and I are doing actually tomorrow. We've been working with the elementary school and we're having a trial. And this is not 1963, uh, this is 1839. Nine. And it's the trial of Andrew Jackson, but it has a lot to do with this because the reason we put Andrew Jackson on trial, he was America's hero. He was the president of the common man. Everybody knows what a hero Andrew Jackson is. But when you start delving into the history and looking at the primary sources, when we say Andrew Jackson was the people's president, he wasn't the president of all the people. He held slaves. He had slaves in his house, he had slaves on his land. So, uh-oh, there's a whole <coughs> slew of people that he's not, um, he's not the president of. And then, his very first legislative act was to pass the Indian Removal Act. So there's another whole group of people that he wasn't the president of. So when you start looking, he had some nicknames like the dueling president. Uh, when we think of a president of the United States in 1839, dueling, he had a terrible temper, he was a hothead. So we put him on trial. We talked about 
the great things he did, the Battle of New Orleans, Horseshoe Bend, another reason to study history and let children know the children we were dealing with didn't know that Horseshoe Bend's right down the road. Uh, they may not know that all these things we're talking about in 1963 are right here in Birmingham, Alabama. So it's, it's important. Uh, the children did wanted posters and they did quite a good job of, uh, they put his aliases, wanted Andrew Jackson, alias Old Henry, alias the dueling president. Uh, then they put his crime. Why are we putting him on trial? We have to have his crime. Uh, so they did a great job. And just, just to follow up on that idea a little bit, I practiced my uh, southern accent with a little bit of deeper twang in it for my role tomorrow's Andy Jackson. I have my 19th century gentleman's cane, my top hat, and everything ready, the white stuff to put in my hair. Once that trial is finished and both sides are heard, the students are going to be the jury, and they're going to write innocent and guilty on one side. And here's the key with all these activities, guys, that we talked about. On the other side, they have to use evidence to support their point of view with an innocent or guilty verdict. And all these activities we talked about are based on the notion that students are using evidence one way or the other through creating their own primary, their faux primary sources. Other questions? I think we ended with like nine minutes to spare. Do you have anything else? Um, let's see. I could try to go to the um, story bird to show. Oh yeah, that'd be that'd be great. We, um, technology will work. Yeah, this technology was not <coughs> working so well. Just go down right, right here and minimize it. On the thumb drive that's in the packet that you're getting at the end of the day, there's an elementary session that we did at the beginning, and one of the websites that we use was called Storybird. Storybird allows students to create their own children's literature books. And here's the key, guys. It's the most beautiful, beautiful word in the English language to teachers. It is, oh my goodness, I did not even have to say it. It is free, yes. How many, has anybody used Storybird? It's a great website and children love it. I used it with my English language learners who told me, uh, but you don't understand, I don't know English, I can't, I can't write. I mean, it's like, what are you asking me to do? <coughs> then we turned on Storybird and they absolutely loved it. They wrote great stories. So when you sign in, um, you come to all the work that you've done. So I did a story bird on uh, Child of the Children's March. And they give you artwork. The artwork is fabulous. And they have so much artwork and children can look and get inspired by art and then write something. And when I looked at the art, I saw uh, this little girl, and I saw a lot of pictures that um, made me think about what story I wanted to write. Well, see, you're supposed to be able to click the arrow and it goes to the next page. Oh, it's working now. Okay, even though I'm a child, I believe big dreams can become reality. Every night I dream about the words I hear in church and in school. I can be anything I want to be if I'm willing to march for what I believe. And these, this is just artwork that is on Storybird. Okay, now it's doing the same thing it did before. Try the other one. There you go. The words are sometimes frightening. I must be brave and do my part. What we are fighting for is too important to forget. It's too important to my people and to me. I will stand up for what I know to be right. I know that God is on the side of right and our cause is just. In other houses in our city, are other little girls dreaming big? Do they too 
believe in opportunity for all. Today is the day. I'm ready to march and sing for peace and freedom for all people. I will march. Listen to the great leaders in our city and never stop singing, never stop dreaming big dreams. I will be free, free, free. I am a child of the Children's March of 1963. The world will be watching. History will be made. I am happy to play my part. Never stop dreaming big dreams. The end. So that's just a little story I created on Storybird. And if you give your children the opportunity to go to this free website, and if you don't have this in your classroom, if you don't have internet access, if you don't have computers, uh, some of the children do have computers at their home. You could let them do it at home. Uh, it can be emailed to someone. Uh, the other thing is it's very easy to collaborate. There's a little button that you click and it says collaborate and it brings up uh, a space for you to invite someone else. So you can have a group of children working on uh, a storyboard. Yes? Now, do you have to use the artwork that's in the on this one? Room? On this yes. one you do. Can you upload your artwork? You can on this one, but if you go to Zoobird, dot com z o o dot com you can actually create um, pop up books they are so cool you turn the page and it pops up just like a real pop up book you can upload photos for that also if you have an iPad there's there's a book creator and um, you can upload photos on that one too all of these the thing that that I really like about them they are so easy it's just intuitive. The, There's not a lot of uh, instruction that you have to do for children to be able to use these. The other what? Are you able to print out? Yes. 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 You can print them out. You can send them. You can publish them. If I wanted that book published, I click publish. You can keep it private, but you don't have to publish it. Uh, or you can publish it. If you publish it, other people can make comments. But they do monitor that. So which is very nice if you want children to use it because sometimes you might have somebody go on and make a comment that's inappropriate but they do monitor that the other website that you can upload your own images if you download photo story 3 you can it's called photo story 3 and again it's that beautiful phrase of free yeah you can and that one they can even narrate is it the number three or do you write the, the, number, the number three yeah with photo story 3 guys you upload images that you select and you can add text and you can narrate each image and you can you can organize them in a whatever pattern you want so that you tell a narrative story through the process it's very powerful and then can you go, go in and print those pages out too and it's just a vid it's a video you can print the you can print them but it's it's a video at the end that students can create about a topic the nice thing is you can also upload your own music or Photo Story 3 has free music already in the program to use as well. Uh, yes, they are. Another one is Animoto. And I just saw a student uh, do an Animoto. At the big, you have music on there. You can uh, upload pictures. And she did the heart and narrated all the different parts of the heart while this music was in the background. But the circular board system, how it works, there's so many uses for these. Uh, I, I how do you spell that? A N I M O T O. Animoto. That's free also. It's free for a 30 second video. If you want longer videos, you pay. It, but I know when I was teaching, uh, my system paid for that for me. And I'll tell you that the squeaky wheel gets the grief. I asked over and over and over and over, and I invited my technology coordinator to come into my classroom because I use technology all the time. And uh, she learned a lot of websites that she didn't know about. So she was my advocate for, okay, let's get to the money to do this because she actually uses it. And that's another thing. If you actually use it and you can show how you're using it and show what your students are doing, a lot of times you're able to get uh, some of these resources. I'm going to show them one more. I think we have time. I'm going to show you one more website before we uh, dismiss. 
Uh, this website was something that my friend and I created. These are, it's called History Space Book. These are history Facebook pages that my friend and I created for world and U.S. history figures used, based upon primary sources. I'm more of a U.S. history person, whereas he's a world history individual. So I'm just going to open up one of these. I'm going to open up, uh, let's open up, top, oh, let's see, George Washington. I have the basic content knowledge, who he was, what party he belonged to. Then I get to the more interesting aspects, political views, status. Here's the high order part. With the wall, I made him friends. I'm going to scroll down, then scroll back up. I made him friends with people of his time period, then I made him friends with contemporary figures. Since Washington is a famous general, it makes sense to me that he'd be friends with Yoda. It also makes sense that he'd be friends with Dwight Eisenhower. So I'm going to scroll up just quickly and share one wall story with you. George Washington Post. Any suggestions on how to defeat the British? Yoda, the force you must use, and a lightsaber helps. Why, thank you, Mr. Yoda. Does anyone else have suggestions? You must use support, superior force to overwhelm your enemy. Mr. Eisenhower, that is really not an option. Why do I have that in there, guys? Yeah, superior force is not an option for the American cause in the 1700s. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Mr. Washington, this comes from Herm Edwards, who was the coach for the Jets. You play to win the game. Mr. Washington, it is okay to play dirty since you are fighting for independence of this country. George Washington likes guerrilla warfare. And that's just another one. And PB Works is a free website, guys, that you can create your own accounts. I'm going to go back really quick. Uh, PB Works. PB Works. You'll notice here that also with this website, my friend and I left something nice for everyone. Blank template. All you have to do is go in there and you have a template ready for you to create your own Facebook pages. Thank you. Is that still online? It is still online, yes. Okay. And I think we're out of time. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Get this back on there.